Welcome to Web Chat Wednesdays. I'm Chris, and I'm a studio guide at the Long Beach Public Library, and I'm here with Ryan. Hi, everyone. I'm Ryan. And our special guest today is Mariah Hoffman. Mariah Hoffman is a designer and entrepreneur based in Long Beach. She started her own business called Micro Modula and has designed and built her own tiny home. And Mariah, we're so happy to have you here today. Is there anything you want to add to the intro? Happy to be here and yeah, happy to talk about my tiny house and the process and my brand. Thank you so much. So great to have you. Um, so our first question is, how long have you been based in Long Beach? So I've been based in Long Beach um, close to coming up on two years. What does it feel like to be in a home that you built? I think being in a home that you built, just not only built, but kind of seeing the whole process, the process for me took um, basically five years and it's pretty humbling, um, especially kind of seeing, being intimately involved in every you know, phase of the build and planning. Yeah, it's, it's pretty sacred. On your blog, you speak about a creative awakening that inspired you to begin building your tiny house. Um, can you talk a little bit about what led to that awakening? I was, you know, fresh out of college a um, few years back and living in uh, the Bay Area at the time. And, you know, just trying to figure out life and work and um, trying to get, you know, st a stable livelihood going and um, was just really struggling in terms of not only like financially trying to build a solid foundation for myself, but just trying to explore what you know, where my interests were going to take me um, and what was really calling me. And I was, you know, working multiple jobs, retail, everything, barely getting by um, and was really trying to like reflect on, you know, what, what was really calling me in terms of like my path. Um, and I took some time and especially, you know, when, when your back is up against the wall and you're like really have, you know, no fallback plan, no financial safety net. I was really kind of I was really called to like dig deep and try and understand like what's really going on and what do I want to express. Um, I had always been been interested in architecture and design growing up as a kid, um, and I always like kind of thought about building my dream home and you know would kind of relish it architectural magazines. But I always figured it'd be a, you know a longer term process. Um, but coming out of college, I just was you know really I felt kind of more and more pulled to explore architecture, um, and so I just started doing a lot of reflecting on, um, I picked up a book called The Artist's Way, um, which was really helpful in terms of like unlocking where my creative and artistic fears were, what was really holding me back, um, why I was shying away from exploring certain things. Um, and then um, I actually, at that point, you know, it's been a few months of just trying to like understand and unpack like what's going on, why I was still like being drawn to architecture, what it, what it meant. And at the time, tiny houses weren't even really mainstream, I would say. They were kind of, you saw them on Pinterest a little bit on some blogs, but they weren't. Um, HGTV hadn't really come out yet with, you know, with the Tiny House Nation and all of that. And so, um, but it's it'd been kind of a little, you know, there's a little seed in the back of my head. Um, and then it wasn't until um, I actually was um, on a trip with some family and I ended up in Northern California and I ended up stumbling across um, a tiny house in person. Uh, the first one that I'd ever seen in person. And I was like, freaking out. <laughs> I was like so curious. I'm like, I think this is one of those tiny house things. And I was just like nosing around and like, um, ex like basically just like poking my head around and this woman walks out um, and she had like tools or chops on and everything. And I was like, what is this? How do I do this? And um, she was so gracious. She, you know, let me walk inside. Uh, let me kind of see the space for myself. And that's like when it clicked for me, I was like, I have to figure out how to do this. Um, it was basically that moment of like, she told me about, you know, how she learned to build over the course of a year. Um, and, you know, with the help of her, her family. And um, for me, that was like the permission of like, if I can do this, you can too. And I didn't know exactly how I was going to make it work. Um, I just knew like, I have to try and do this and then that'll get me to where I need to be somehow. <laughs> so that's when I kind of like, I got hooked and I was like, I'm going to try and figure out how to make a tiny house. And I did. I think it's really interesting that it's slightly, your adventure was slightly inspired by like a chance encounter. Yeah, and it was, it was chance, but it was also like, I think for me, you know, having, had I not done so much reflection on like what was really calling me, what was so important to me, and also like what it meant to me and 
the livelihood I was trying to create for myself, you know, like trying to find and build my own safe space and like what that meant. Mm -hmm. Had I not done that reflection, I probably would not have even, you know, been called to, you know, walk up to the stranger and ask if I could see inside their house, you know? And so um, I just felt like it was pretty synchronistic. Yeah, that's awesome. It's really cool to hear um, this process of like that inspiration and the reflection. And it, it makes me wonder, when do you feel the most creative? It's funny because growing up, I actually grew up in a family of artists, like traditionally. Um, my sister's a painter. My grandmother was a painter. Um, my, my father was an art dealer. So I actually grew up around traditional like fine art, I guess you would say. So I actually didn't even consider myself an artist or creative for a very long time. I actually was like, I rebelled and like did everything else. I like played sports and I did everything else. And I didn't even consider myself um, an artist per se. Um, and it wasn't until kind of circled back into, you know, design and architecture in the tiny house that I realized I actually do have a very strong creative voice. Um, but for me, creativity is really um, kind of interconnected with like problem solving um, and working with my hands. And so, although I love to sketch, like I feel the most creative when I'm even just like sketching and out an idea, I can like visual, I really get like spatial visualizing. So I really love to just like be loose and sketch, charcoals, watercolors, all of that fun stuff. Um, but when I actually moved through the, you know, was working through the process of the build, I actually realized, you know, it's when I have a problem to solve, like how, how am I gonna fit, you know, a bed within this space and I have to actually figure out um, you know, the framing plan of something like that to me, the architectural design of that or this, the design and the actual fabrication of that um, is usually when I feel the most creative, but it's usually linked to, again, I have to address some kind of, you know, challenge um, or puzzle when it comes to like spatial, um, spatial designs. How did you get started putting this idea into action? And what did planning this project look like for you? Saw my first house in person and I was like, I've got to do this. I don't know how. Um, at the time I was living in the Bay Area and my mom was living in San Diego and she would recommended um, coming down to San Diego because there was more space for like, you know, construction and fabrication. And at the time she was working out of um, another maker space. It's called Maker Place um, in um, Shout out Maker Place, no longer exists actually, but it was an amazing maker space where, you know, there was woodworking, metalworking, all of that. Um, and so she said, just come down here, you know, you'll, um, you can be exposed to all the trades and just kind of play around and see, um, you know, figure it out. So I ended up packing up my life in my little Honda Fit and moving from San Diego, to, I'm sorry, from the Bay Area to San Diego to build my tiny house and uh, started just kind of going to make her place religiously and just showing up and trying to learn as much as possible. But I realized the first phase was really just the planning, like you said, in terms of how do I get a trailer? Where do I park it? Where do I build it? There's a million questions you have to ask yourself before even starting um, this project. And, um, and so I kind of landed in, I landed in San Diego and I realized, okay, the first part is just planning all, as much as I can with what I knew at the time. Um, you don't know what you don't know when it comes to this type of work. So I spent eight months actually just in the planning phase, um, figuring out even how I could get some cash or some capital to even get a trailer. Um, I found a meetup group of other tiny house enthusiasts at the time, um, and I ended up kind of leading an eight week workshop to kind of go through all the different phases and it helped me put together like just research basically. Um, and so just was in conversation with a lot of people and over the course of eight months and then eventually um, that led to me getting my trailer. So that's kind of just with a lot of like networking, researching um, and planning for about eight months before I even started any construction. Yeah. And did you already know like construction, like how to do construction beforehand or did you? Learn? I barely knew how to use a drill when I first started. So it was this entire thing was like, I was so eager to just learn hands on, but I had, close to zero building um, skills when I first started this project. Uh, so I knew I would have to take baby steps. <laughs> um, so that's when it kind of Maker Place became an invaluable resource to me when I first started. Do you have any advice for people who are like barely starting to use tools? Yes, yeah, so uh, start small. <laughs> Even though it's a tiny house, it's not a tiny project. So um, people often say like, build a shed first. I say, build a box first, you know, learn how to frame something very small um, and like use that as a starting point. 
Um, I, like I mentioned a little bit about Maker Place. Um, it was an amazing resource. It was, a, it was a DIY fabrication shop. And so there was a wood shop, metal shop, laser cutting, 3D printing. Um, and so I actually just, I showed up every single day. And then finally it was like, I wanna take all these classes, but I couldn't afford to pay for them. And so I ended up becoming the office manager <laughs> of the fabrication shop. Um, and I took every class that I could and was also able to like mingle with you know contractors and cabinet makers and welders um and like you know women running their you know fabrication you know businesses it just was so it was a such a rich resource for me to just i mean i basically went to maker school you know and i was just trying to kind of learn as much as possible so recommendations for people before even buying tools see if you can join a maker space if you can to just try things out take some classes um, I know right now it's tricky with COVID, but there's lots of online classes um, and start small, build a planter box, frame something small, then maybe build a shed. Um, and then if you're interested to go bigger, but uh, I definitely bit off a little more than I could chew at first. <laughs> wow. I love hearing how a maker space like was able to help this come to fruition and to just help you with everything because there are these resources like the library the studio at the library that are like here and they like want to encourage people like us who like love making things and love designing things and building things but like maybe don't have the knowledge like right away or all of the knowledge but yeah. um it's there it's there well and it was also a resource you know i mean I, I couldn't afford to buy all the tools when i first started for example and i didn't know exactly what tools i was going to need and so um that was the great resource of a maker space you can rent all the tools obviously on site um, but you can at least become more familiar and comfortable with not only tools, but all the different, you know, how to maintain them and, you know, the ins and outs of the machinery and without having to invest thousands and thousands of dollars up front um, while you're just learning. So it's a, yeah, it's an incredible resource for that. It's also cool that, you know, you just like carved your own path, you know, you couldn't afford the classes. And so you like, <laughs> you that a lot of people will probably be like, oh, I guess I can't do it, but instead, you know, you know, you became uh, an employee there, which is dope. Yeah, I found found a way. <laughs> yeah, but also bouncing off what Ryan said, like, yeah, I wouldn't really be where I'm at as like a designer unless I had like walked into the studio, which is the makerspace of the Long Beach Public Library, like the old one. Like, I had no idea about anything about three D printing, um, and I was like going to school to be like an English major. Mm -hmm. And like I just saw like all the cool things they were doing and I'm like dude I just want to do all this stuff all day long so I think that's another like there was like another tip embedded within that I think of all the things you were saying and that was just like going out into the world and like talking to people and networking and just you know just exploring the world yeah well and I think I, I like to think about it like creative play you know there's um it's different when you're running you know fabrication industrial design company where you actually just need to go into production mode, but if you have the privilege or you have the space or somehow have the opportunities to just play around. I mean, this is something, you know, this is again, the value of design and exposing kids to this at a young age, because it really allows you to just open your imagination, not be afraid to like mess up. Um, you know, you might, you're probably going to build something that's not going to hold up or whatever, but you can at least play around enough to understand your ideas. And at least, like I said, that's for me, how I work out my ideas. Like I can sketch it and I can visually understand, but I also like to just work with materials. Um, and it's a great, I think it's just, it's an important part of any design process is to iterate, to keep iterating, um, and being okay with that. Cause you're never going to go from idea to like perfect end product, um, on their first try. It's just not feasible <laughs> yeah definitely i know you said you bit off more than you could, could yeah. you know, like maybe something specific um yeah so there were plenty of um learning lessons in <laughs> in this process the i guess you could say biggest in terms of like the scale and the impact of um, this mistake or not mistake but just this challenge was my framing. So I actually bought a trailer, a used trailer, and most people traditionally frame their tiny houses out of wood, um, at least in the, the first few you know, years of the movement, people are framing it out of wood and basically bolting it to a trailer. Um, I bought a used trailer that actually had an existing steel kind of square tubing frame that was welded together. Um, it had really good bones and it was really solid foundation, 
when I purchased the trailer, I realized that it was little, if I were just to have enclosed the box that is, it was a, tra a former ATV trailer. So it was used to haul like motorcycles out to the desert. So I had a really good axles, like good bones. Um, but if I were just to have enclosed it the way it, it the, at the scale that it was, I mean, it was like, you know, a foot narrower and like, and only about like six feet tall or something like that, I would have really felt like I was living in a shoebox. Um, so one of my first tasks was actually to like reframe the, um, my trailer, my frame. And so in my head, I was like, oh yeah, we'll just like, you know, chop up the, chop up this frame and like re-weld it, no problem. Um, that ended up taking me a year <laughs> of just that process um, because I actually, um, because of the original frame, I decided to actually continue the, with the welding, you know, the same kind of material tubing and welding all together. Um, but I didn't have, person say I didn't have formal blueprints to begin with. I was kind of just like designing it as I went along, um, which I wouldn't do again but um kind of built a box and then i learned i hired a friend as a structural welder to start me off and just kind of help me get the um, outside box and then i learned through maker place and through working with him how to prep metal grind it weld myself and then within a few you know weeks to a month i was welding the rest of the house but that just to get the frame kind of restructured so that it was a foot wider and about three feet taller so it actually kind of was comfortable enough for me that ended up taking close to a year so um, I wouldn't do that again. <laughs> I would have plans, uh, formal, formal plans, at least more so um, in advance. And I mean, now there's like aluminum frames, which weren't really popular before, but you don't have to weld it. You obviously can just, you know, snap it together, bolt it versus having a weld. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't regret having learned because I was actually like, I learned to weld before I even learned, you know, I had a grinder and a welding machine before I was even like had a drill. So that was actually not traditionally the route that people would do with tiny houses, but I don't regret that part. But um, in terms of like that process, I did not expect that, that would take me that long. But, um, you know, I had to inch my way through that. I didn't know that you needed to know how to weld necessarily to build a tiny home. Um, well, you said you didn't for, for like aluminum and stuff, but I yeah, think it's you know, you know, not everyone needs to. I actually didn't do a traditional route. That's why I kind of was like, I mean, I, I for, for, for my particular project, I also wanted a trailer that would be, I wanted my frame to be more structurally sound when it's towed. And so I figured if it's all welded together um, to the actual trailer frame versus just being bolted in place, just felt like it was more of a solid foundation to work with. Um, and so I don't like, I don't get that, but not, most people don't typically do that, but, um, but it's possible. Yeah. Well, I think it's really awesome how you take a, maybe what could be considered an obstacle and turn it into a, a learning experience. And I think, uh, that's like a really great skill to have in general. I'm grateful to know it, especially to, you know, have that again, add that to my toolkit, um, in this process. It's definitely, even if I don't, you know, use it all the time. It's just really empowering to be able to know what goes into, and I mean, there's even different types of welding, um, but just to understand like metals, um, it's definitely, you know, when it comes to construction, there's there's like the woodworking and then some, you know, many people don't even get to the metalworking and it's, it's really intimidating. It really is, honestly, it's an intimidating material. It's heavy, it's really like tricky to work with and it's not as forgiving as wood if you mess up. Um, but that process of like having to like mass, not just master, but having to work with a really, really challenging material up front, I think it, it did end up like kind of grooming me for the rest of everything else kind of after that felt a lot easier because <laughs> I had learned to kind of like work with a very, otherwise a very intimidating material. What section of the tiny house are you most proud of? And what was the thought process behind designing it? Learning to weld, it was like, I by the end, I just like, I felt like a boss, you know, because I was like, I could speak to, you know, a material that I'm not a lot, I mean, I shouldn't say not a lot of women, because actually I realize a lot of women are amazing welders. Um, it's actually very, people think it's a very mm, gruesome, like, process, but in fact, it's actually very, like, hand-eye coordination and precision, at least the kind of welding that I was doing, and so um, it required a lot of patience, but that was something that I actually became really proud of, and so what, how that informed the rest of my build, and I'm really proud of it, because the way I kind of worked with it was 
I decided to leave, since I'd done all that work, <laughs> I decided to leave parts of the frame exposed um, inside the interior of my house. And as a nod to kind of mid-century, traditional mid-century architecture, kind of exposed steel beams, I wanted that, I figured if I could at least, if I did not, I'd done all that work, um, I wanted to at least be able to like, I didn't want to just cover it all up and panel it all, never be able to see it. So I left some of the um, beams exposed in the interior of my house and I get to at least appreciate it um, and celebrate the material and, and the work that I did. So I, I'm, mo I'm most proud of it, and especially because I know every, I know the sweat that went into like every single corner. Um, sometimes tears too, you know, <laughs> do what I had to do to, to get it done, so. I love that there's like a story behind every individual part of the whole build. That's really cool. Um, and another very important part is the name of the tiny home. Can you tell us how you decided on the name Lola for your tiny home? Sure. So um, I was um, basically, let's see, I was at the point where I was actually purchasing my trailer, I was, you know, writing up, we were crossing the, you know, pink slips, we were exchanging the pink slips in hand from, you know, this used trailer that I was purchasing. Um, and it was like, okay, this is like the marker of like, this is the step, you're taking this big step to um, finally launch your journey. And it was a huge moment for me. Um, and as I was in the process of purchasing my trailer, um, I got a call that my grandmother in the Philippines had passed away. Um, and my, I'm half Filipino, so my mom's side is from the Philippines. My Lola, Lola means grandmother in Tagalog. And so um, I, you know, it was a very emotional moment as I was launching my journey, what felt like the beginning of my life, what felt like, you know, embarking on this, this very kind of spiritual creative process to hear that my Lola had passed away in that moment. Um, it just felt like I just wanted to be able to honor her um, and her life. You know, she immigrated from the Philippines um, and raised my mom and my aunt here, basically, you know, as a single mother. And it just it, had she not done that, like there's so many, you know, linkages in, in ancestral histories that I just wanted to be able to honor that, you know, led led to me being where I am, to, to me having the opportunities that I have today. And so I figured it was, you know, not only to honor her, but also to honor my maternal grandmother was something that, you know, felt like it just felt right to be able to kind of carry on their history and speak to that. Um, and that spirit of, you know, a grandmother and like that protector and that like ancestral history definitely, I felt like was able to, you know, I was hopefully was able to honor that and carry me through um, the, the process and the journey. I think that's a beautiful way to honor her especially because in like a metaphorical sense too, because like she came here and she, you know, she started a legacy and then, you know, you're building this like physical version of that through your tiny home. Yeah. Also, I'm apologizing in advance because the garbage truck is passing by right now. So if you hear that in the background, <laughs> but that's awesome. I think it's especially meaningful that like she traveled here and your tiny home is a building that travels mm. and she is home. I mean, I don't want to speak for you, but uh, at least grandmas are, and your tiny home is a home that's mm -hmm. traveling. So I think there's something really special about that. I don't know. That's a really nice um, sentiment. I think there's something to the mobility. For me, the house, even what it represents in terms of allowing me to, you know, not only mobilize myself, but to, to create kind of that social mobility, um, through the process and through the work, I think that's, yeah, there's a lot of parallels um, that continue to come up and it kind of started with this very kind of intense moment and, and I appreciate that because it, it does, there was a lot to that movement um, and that history that I think is is important to, and a lot of, a lot of people can, you know, can resonate with that too. We have a lot of us have, you know, histories of, um, of movement and transition and, you know, immigration and all of that. Moving along in that line, what places have you taken your tiny home? So I don't move it that often um, because it's not as easy to move as it seems. <laughs> um, some houses are built, you know, a lot lighter and they're meant to be moved all the time. Um, my intent with the house was never to, was maybe to kind of be stationed a few years at a time. Um, but I did tow it once um, when 
I basically finished the frame. We had, there was an open house and maker fair at Maker Place actually um, in San Diego. And we had, um, I brought the frame, we towed it to the event to kind of show people the process. And that was pretty cool. So uh, that was the first time I'd seen it move, you know, as it was kind of becoming my home. And, and that was um, a pretty surreal experience. But then we brought it back to the um, build site and then finished the build. And I haven't moved it since, um, but it eventually, I mean, it's built on a, you know, a trailer hitch. So it just needs to be like, you know, hook, uh, hooked up and connected to be able to be towed. But um, yeah, haven't moved it since then. I'm a little nervous, not gonna lie. Moving it, it's always scarier than it seems because it's like your whole life <laughs> in this, in this on wheels. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about, you know, like design. Um, how would you describe your design style? Of the house or just the brand in general? Um, I would say, I guess the brand in general, if there is like a through line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've got a few pillars that kind of guide guide my design work and kind of were informed by the house process, um, sustainability, um, modular and minimalist. Um, and they kind of represent different, kind of different feelings for me. And so um, whether it's from the jewelry that I make, um, which is made from, all my earrings are made from scrap acrylic. And so, you know, materials that I found in Maker Place, that's, that's the thing I realized actually at Maker Place and in the, you know, fabrication, there's so much waste. And so I was actually, actually able to make, you know, jewelry, not only for myself, but just from, from waste of, you know, others production. So um, I actually worked with, when I first made the jewelry, um, I made it for myself with a, uh, uh, a friend who actually she had a laser cut kind of party supply brand and she had all this scrap and so she was able to partner with me and she you know gave me her scraps and I was able to cut my original earrings out of that and so to kind of you know kind of eliminate as much waste as possible um so sustainability for me is really it's really about materials but it also for me connects back to what is equitable in terms of resources so how do we understand how much resources we use, what's equitable for the planet, and equity also, you know, sustainability and equity kind of are very interconnected for me in terms of how we access materials um, and how we care for the earth and how we care for, um, you know, our own community. Um, and then the other pillar being, um, what did I say? Oh, modular. So, you know, I have products. Um, I'm hoping to launch more products in the future, but right now I have just um, earrings and I've prototyped a few like um, tables as well that are modular and for me that's a pillar because I think of modular design as resilience and so if it's adaptable if it's if you have furniture for example that can flat pack or can you know be adapted to different um, uses then if you're more you know adaptable then you are more resilient and we're seeing that a lot right now as it pertains to COVID people living at home you need things and products that are going to be able to serve multiple purposes um, and so I just really have always been drawn to modular design um, so my earrings for example um, they're all interchangeable you can just change the wires with different um, to color, some of them are reversible, and then hopefully in the future, you know, more home products that will kind of incorporate the modular aspect as well. Um, same thing with the house, you know, I wanted to have as many um, kind of grid-like features that I can adapt. So my kitchen, for example, has shelving that I just, I use like a retail grid wall so I can actually just adjust the shelving to different heights or different lengths depending on my needs. So um, that was something that for me informed that, you know, design process. And then minimalism is a huge, huge theme for me. I mean, if you look at my aesthetic, it looks minim it looks minimal minimal in terms of aesthetics, but for me, it runs deeper than that and it's about intentionality. And so that was the biggest thing about, you know, uh, about this tiny house process for me was really um, understanding, you know, a lot of people when they hear the words minimal or even tiny house, they think of it um, in relation to scarcity. And for me, it's about um, the opposite. It's about really taking stock in what you really need and what is important to you and what your values are. And so that can come in the form of material objects and it can come in the form of relationships and what's important to you and your values. So um, those are the three pillars, sustainable, um, modular and minimal that really kind of inform my products and my process. I think it's great for like artists and creators to have pillars or like a, just like yeah, to have like an internal compass and, and know exactly like what they're trying to make. And um, yeah, you touched a little bit about um, modularity. 
And I think uh, modular design is really awesome just because, and it does fit really well into sustainability because, you know, we make things that aren't really built to last and they're often built to break intentionally. And I think if, you know, the world starts designing things that are more, more modular and they're built to be, you know, continually to be built upon, I think we could end up in a better place. Yeah. But that's great. Also, I really liked your uh, modular, you had like this acrylic, the acrylic, these two pieces on your website that were really cool and you could like oh. rearrange it and make these geometric yeah, patterns. Over here actually. That's what you said. I just they found were, one of They them. were both sold out. One? Oh, they're big too. A little 10 by 10, yeah. I, you know, I was talking about play. It's funny you said that because I just found this the other day. I, I loved, you know, trying out depth of like, you know, with acrylic, how do you do different layers and levels and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, that was a, a fun little, you know, in terms of both now like laser cutting, laser etching, I was kind of just trying to play with like how it would be perceived if you, if you layer different like etchings on top of each other. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm hoping to, you know, in the future do more um, kind of products, but I think right now it's, uh, it's interesting because the modular products for me are something that like, that's, that's the creative play that I get to do. So whatever, you know, if maybe every year I'll do a different product or different furniture piece or something like that. And that, that to me is kind of like the rotating thing that whatever I'm inspired by, whether it's materially or a need that I have, um, I get to use the products as, the, as that kind of outlet. When you were younger, you would go through like architecture magazines and like design magazines. Do you have a favorite architect or designer? A favorite architect or designer. So or several of them. Yeah, there's a there's a few. Um, one of the earliest architects that I was inspired by is an architect by the name of uh, was an architect by the name of Samuel Mockby. Um, and he um, I remember seeing this documentary when I was like, I don't know, maybe seven or something. And I was like, mind blown because he um, he started this program in um, in the south called World Studio and he works with architectural students um, in rural communities to design beautiful kind of beautiful homes um, for those who you know need access to housing but they all the all the designs are informed by like reclaimed materials so it was like kind of the true essence of like reclaim before reclaimed was like a sexy thing like it wasn't really a thing at that time but it was really beautiful design using as you know all um all new i'm sorry all kind of reused and repurposed and, and found objects and i remember that being like so beautiful and that program still runs um i just always been inspired by that um another architect that i was inspired by growing up was frank Lloyd wright um i originally grew up in chicago and then my family relocated to the southwest and so seeing both taliesin and arcos i'm sorry taliesin west in arizona and seeing how that design um, could be transferred to kind of a desert landscape was you know was really inspiring for me as a kid um, kind of again it was like using you know sustainable materials in essence but still keeping that kind of modernist um, feel and that was that was something that was really inspiring um, and then more currently um, as I kind of started getting into the maker scene and fabrication, um, I was really inspired by, there's an architect and builder, uh, designer, educator named Emily Pilaton. Um, and she's got an amazing program, does, does, has done amazing work for um, young women in, in this type of work called, I think it's called Girls Garage now, it might have been Project H Design at some point, um, and does a lot to empower young, young girls, teaching them tool, you know, how to use tools and how to do design work and just basically, you know, exposing them to this work at a really early age. So um, I remember seeing her stuff early, early on as I was kind of starting out my project and being really inspired, um, especially as another woman of color in this industry, you know, any voice you can lean on to kind of affirm what you're doing is like, it's nice to have that to, you know, that evidence of it and um and so that's you know that those are just a few examples of work that i'm inspired by you mentioned your jewelry and i see you're wearing your jewelry which is awesome um can you tell us how you first got started designing jewelry yeah so i um again i was working at maker place at the time and was just as we were mentioning, you know, exposed to, you know, there were people working on, you know, woodworking projects and running their own businesses. And there was 
just a lot of scrap material um, just around all the time. And so for me, it, part of it, again, I was just playing around and I, I wanted, um, I love the jewelry for me that's bold and makes a statement, but is also lightweight and makes sense as someone who's walking around like, you know, the shop all the time. So I wanted to create a design that were both lightweight and also like bold and had impact and can still be, you know, whatever I want them to be. So um, at that time, uh, I, like I said, I made friends with a really good friend of mine, Nicole Rosero. Um, her company now is called You Belong Here, but um, at the time she was doing laser cut, um, again, party wear. And so she had a ton of scrap and she's like, hey, do you just you know, want all this scrap? And I was able, the original uh, earring design, Linnea, is actually just, you know, it's basically very simple. And that's, it came from, you know, I really had to make use of like tiny little pieces of scrap. So I cut them in like long rectangles um, and just started making a bunch of them. I started wearing them myself. And then, you know, other women were like, I want a pair. So <laughs> I just started cutting more. Um, and then, um, yeah, it's just kind of a fun thing at this point. And um, I'll be launching some more, you know, hopefully some more products in the coming, I mean, I think, I'm not sure when this will air, but Small Business Saturday, um, you know, I should have some more products out as well. And those are also available on my site. So um, it's just, you know, it's a fun thing for me. And it's also, I think it's an easy entry point into kind of my, my brand and my work. You know, I'm not selling tiny houses, um, but it's also, if you go to my website, you can see, and if you want to, you know, support the brands and support the work that I do, it's, it's one way to do, you know, to do that. I love that. And I love that it's coming out soon. This is a little yeah. teaser for that. That's great. Yeah. Um, can you talk about how your design process with jewelry is similar to or different from your design process with home construction? I mean, it's a lot easier to laser cut an earring than it is to build a house. So their scale, right, is the biggest difference. Um, but the similarities being, you know, prototyping, iteration, playing around. And so, um, I think that speaking to the pillars again about modular, um, minimal, and you know intentional, um, all those applied to my jewelry and to my house. So when I first made my earrings, I knew exactly the shape that I wanted, and I ended up making earrings that I, I mean, I basically wear them every day because I knew exactly you know what I was trying to express, the feeling I was trying to create, um, and same for the house. So modular elements in the house that I knew, um, you know, I wanted to be able to adapt like the kitchen or you know. Uh, tables that fold down. Um, so I think just in the, in the essence of modularity, in the essence of um, sustainability and minimalism, it kind of all applies to both the jewelry and the earrings just at very different scales. Where would you like to take your brand micro modular in the future? Yeah, so I actually, um, I'm going to do a little plug now. <laughs> I am, I've got some exciting things in the works. Um, I have, I'm, you know, wanted to continue this conversation at, of all that I learned in terms of this process, what it mean, meant to me in this journey of, you know, self-exploration, creative exploration, um, again, as a woman navigating this architecture, construction, and fabrication, I really want to continue that conversation and also support other women in this process um, and explore, you know, again, from the tiny house planning side to the design and the build, there's a lot that comes at play. So um, in December, we're gonna be launching some new things. I can't give all the details right now, um, but if people get on my newsletter, um, if you go to the micromodula.com, um, you can get on my newsletter. And on December 1st, I'm gonna be launching something really exciting um, in the way of kind of like, I'll just say virtual learning. <laughs> So I'm really, really excited. I've been working on this over the past few weeks, actually a few months, um, to launch this program and really excited to share. So you gotta go to the website, get on the newsletter, or you can follow me on Instagram, um, micro.modula. Um, and that would be you know, the easiest way to kind of hear about what's coming next. Are you working on any projects that you could share at the moment? Um, that was the biggest one that I wanted to plug, um, but I would say, yeah, stay tuned for the first, on the December 1st for that. Um, and then new earrings, like I said, are actually, that I can, I can share is uh, going to be launching on um, uh, Small Business Saturday. So you can get some earrings for the holidays. Um, so that's coming up in a few days. And then the other thing I wanted to mention, um, oh yeah, so, um, the 
I think I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier, but um, you know, growing up in terms of like unit designers that I was inspired by or kind of work that I was inspired by, um, I grew up just like devouring architectural magazines. <laughs> um, and so Dwell Magazine was one that I, you know, from a really early age was incredibly inspired by, um, you know, just seeing the, you know, not only like the beautiful, you know, aesthetic, um, but just kind of trying to, you know, trans transmit the, the, the future that I wanted to imagine for myself um, into those scenes. But it was really, it was a lot, it was a huge inspiration for me growing up. Um, and it was a big accomplishment, for personal accomplishment for me um, this this year was my house was actually uh, featured in Dwell Magazine um, in an article, which was like, you know, my 12 year old self was like, <laughs> still freaking out a little bit. Um, but that was a huge accomplishment. And I um, was actually just found out, I was actually nominated for um, their 2020 design awards for small spaces category. Um, so, you can be so kind as to go vote. <laughs> um, they have a, they have, you know, their 2020 design awards. Um, and in the category of small spaces, my house was nominated. So if you go to um, the link, either my Instagram or on my website, um, or just dwell.com, like the, the link on the top, you can vote for um, uh, different spaces. And voting closes on December 16th. And then the winners will be announced in January. So that's just one of their little, Blog that I just was like, you know, I'm really proud of um, not only just the work, um, but what what the work says and, and speaks to in terms of the narrative and, and including the narrative of accessible housing in in the room of high design, which was a huge goal for me. That's awesome. I can only imagine like how it feels to be mm -hmm. in some magazine that you used to read when you were younger. And you definitely have my vote. I'm sure you have everyone else's vote <laughs> that Wednesday. Yeah. That's so cool. Congratulations on your nomination. That is so exciting. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's, you know, it, again, if anything, it's whatever happens. I think for me, it's really just, you know, I'm speaking to that little girl that I was at that time wanting to see, you know, women that look like me represented in these types of platforms. And I think it's something that that to me is like what I'm most proud of. Do you see any potential for tiny homes in Long Beach? It's a good question. It's a big question. Um, you know, there's a lot that to unpack when it comes to legalizing tiny. Um, and that is actually something that, you know, we could have a whole hour conversation on that. Um, but I will say, and they're actually, you know, my role, I don't see myself as like a formal advocate per se, like I'm not lobbying for this type of work, but there are those who are doing amazing work as it pertains to um, advocating for including this type of structure in different like municipal codes and in the, in the zoning bylaws and whatnot. Um, so I think there's an amazing group called Latch Collective, um, LA Co-Building, I'm forgetting the acronym right now, I apologize, we'll have to link it, but um, they've done amazing work to actually legalize tiny homes as accessory dwelling units in LA. So there's a lot of groups that are um, kind of individually mobilizing to kind of get different cities and municipalities to accept um, this type of structure as a feasible living structure. Um, and so that is, you know, that, made, that happened last year, that was a huge win for LA and what it speaks to is kind of understanding, you know, part of it is defining this type of structure, right? Like under, like creating a definition for how many square feet, you know, what are the building codes for this type of new structure? And the other part is getting uh, cities to accept it into their kind of, into their code. And so that was a huge one for LA. Um, in terms of what that means for Long Beach, I think, you know, I think there's can be a similar path um, for that, but I also understand that like every city is different in terms of the real estate that you're working with, right? So accessory dwelling units, um, in LA, that makes a lot of sense because you have a lot of granny flats, you know, you have a lot of those types of units that can be just either converted or, you know, used to park a house in that kind of, in that space. So there's not a ton of backyard space in Long Beach. Um, so it kind of changes the, the script a little bit, but I think that, you know, the more cities that start to accept this as a, as a uh, viable living option, the more creative we can get in terms of the spaces that we use and how we use them. Um, so I think if anything, we're making progress. San Diego is also um, legalized them as well. They're creating their own kind of, I think, um, 
protocols in terms of getting that permitted. But um, once LA converted and then San Diego was able to accept it as well, it does kind of speak to, you know, there's more and more um, need for this, especially right now, you know, at, with the pandemic and housing being so unstable um, and people's access to housing being so unstable, like whether I think we should do it or not, it's where we have to go in terms of having options for people and different options for people to safely and comfortably live um, in cities. So I think it's possible. I just don't know, couldn't tell you exactly, you know, how, when, but hopefully it'll, we'll, we'll make steps in that direction. Yeah, I think there's some hope. Uh, Long Beach City Council, just they're considering doing like micro housing units. I'm not sure if that was passed or not but it's definitely a thing. And yeah, living in Long Beach is really expensive. So I think it would be nice for people to have some affordable options. Yeah. Um, yeah and every city is gonna be different if you're talking about, you know, density of, you know, micro units in, in a downtown versus how can we use, you know, backyard space versus, um, you know, land or um, uh, what was the other one? Um, kind of carriage garages in the front, like there's different versions depending on the density or depending on the type of infrastructure that's already in the city. Dang, you guys are like outlaws. It's pretty cool. <laughs> um, what are some of your favorite places in Long Beach? Favorite places? Um, so I have, I shouldn't blow up my spot, but no, I mean, when, uh, when outdoor dining is, allowable which sadly it's not right now um but there is a taco spot in north long beach called Aguas way um yeah. uh it's got an amazing back patio and it's a great little spot awesome food and um shout out noel and my friends did the mural on the outside for powwow a few years ago so it's our it's our little treat to go over there and have a nice little taco on the patio um when we can, <laughs> when we can safely do that. Um, and I also love, um, I live in Alamitos Beach right now. And so um, one of the things that I've really grown to love and appreciate even more during COVID is Alamitos Beach neighborhood, just because I walk all the time now. I mean, I've been walking a lot before, but uh, I walk through my neighborhood a lot a lot now and I just have learned to really like love and appreciate just the neighborhood and you know I've got my my routes that I do and I see I see more now I've, I've noticed more um, about the neighborhood in the past few months because of um, just you know being home so um, shout out on your speech. <laughs> the last question that we love to ask all of our guests is can you tell us about a memorable library experience? Yeah so a library or Long Beach? I'm assuming Long Beach. It could be, I mean, we love you to shout out Long Beach Library, <laughs> um, but it could be any library. It's funny that you asked that because um, I grew up um, around the time that I was like really getting into Dwell Magazine and like in terms of like, like looking at it, I lived in Arizona at the time and I was in, I think I was in middle school at that time. Um, and so one of the pastimes, like if I just, you know, needed to get away from um, stress of the home and just everything that was going on, um, my sister, my big sister and I would go to, we'd walk over to the, our neighborhood library, shout out Tempe Public Library. <laughs> um, and we would walk over because it was like, you know, a few blocks away. And um, she would go to the art section and I would go to the design architecture section and I would just, you know, hunker down and we would just spend a few hours there. And that's when I really started like, again, I would just check out all the books on modern, you know, modern architecture. And that's even how I started to like, um, I would, you know, look at Dwell, I would look at all these things and I would even start to like, um, I would check them out and I would just practice my sketching. So I would just, if I liked kind of, um, you know, an interior or, you know, certain angle, I would just practice like drawing it in, in the way that I saw the photograph and it helped me kind of like understand like perspective and like um, things that I liked. And so that was like my favorite thing to do at that time, especially when, you know, things were hard at home and just wanted to escape. It was like a great way to escape and it had an AC, so it was Arizona. <laughs> so great way to cool off and also like just get lost in this world. And, you know, my sister would go do her thing and then we would just like walk back, so. Great. That was that definitely was a was a good memory of you know that time. Wow. Thanks for the library. <laughs>
Um, and that concludes our interview. Thanks again for all your time. This one was a doozy. It was really, you had these really long detailed answers. And so we have a lot of stuff to work with. So thank you. Hopefully, uh, hopefully you don't have to do too much editing, um, but I appreciate the conversation. Yeah, it was a great conversation. And I'm excited to see the new jewelry that you drop. And I'm excited to see, you know, the future of your brand. One, I can only imagine like what's going to happen, you know, when things open back up again. And I, I'm excited. Thank you. And it's cool how much you're able to do like during quarantine and like while thing, like things are still virtual, like, like it's really awesome that you're able to still connect with your audience and your patrons and like give them material and help them and continue your brand and your business during and that's all what I'm this. trying to do right now is really just lean into that you know because telling my story I think is one of the most powerful ways to connect with people um and there's a lot to unpack there but I just you know hearing how it's connecting with other women and inspiring people in general I think is something that I realize is like just have to keep doing that and um, if anything, because we're, uh, you know, we are more comfortable with virtual now and because we're, you know, more used to connecting in this way, I think it is, it's an opportunity to connect with even more people, I think, um, because it's one, you know, it's a platform that we can lean into right now.